We all know there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So we're going to make you work during uh, lunch a little bit. You may have noticed in the front row we have some young, I guess they're young, huh, compared to the rest of us, young folks here that are from uh, culinary students. And so we have some challenges. And what we'd like to do is, uh, during our luncheon in the, in the room where we had breakfast this morning, have you sit in one of five groups. And I think there's eight or nine students. So in some cases, you'll have two students working with you, in some cases, one. But we've got five different challenges we want to have you take a look at. And the students will lead the discussion, and they'll come back and present um, uh, up here after lunch and present the ideas that we've discussed. But there's five different challenges. So let me read those to you. In case you're interested in one particular one, you'll have a chance to sit in that area. So number one, you're a QSR chain and have been asked to come up with an item featuring strawberries that would be on the menu year-round. How would you meet this challenge? What, who would be in on the decision-making? How would you manage the cost fluctuations throughout the year? How would you make sure you have guest buy-in when lots of consumers know that strawberries are seasonal? Number two, you're an on-site feeder and charged with adding a few vegan items to the menu. How would you get the non-vegans to order these items? How would you come up with the menu items initially? What kind of research would you do? How would you get your distributor involved? And how would you market this to the guests? Number three, you're a school food service operator in a district that is challenged financially, aren't they all, and asked to comply with a new ruling that requires fresh produce to be increased by 22%. What would be the first thing you would do to tackle this challenge? Where would you go for guidance? And would you involve the children and parents, and how? Number four, you've been getting a myriad of complaints about the quality of your salad bar ingredients. I'll make no comment about your choice of distributor. But how would you go about getting more specific feedback? How will you upgrade your offerings without breaking the bank? And who do you involve and what would prompt you to change distributors or suppliers? And once the changes are in place, how would you bring back those unhappy consumers? And then fifth, you are a university and your students have complained that they are gaining more than their freshman 15. How can you use fresh produce to offer more flavorful dishes with less calories? Where do you go for ideas? How do you involve the student body? How do you keep costs down? How do you change the menu items on a regular basis to keep students engaged? So those are the five challenges. We're going to ask everybody to participate. Thank you all for your participation in helping our students address these uh, questions. We will work from right to left. So who was on team one? If you'd come up, team one, come up. Please introduce yourselves and read your challenge to us, uh, if you would, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail O'Banner, and I'm a student at the La Cordon Bleu out of Chicago, Illinois. And our, ch our challenge today was you are a QSR chain, and you have been asked to come up with an item featuring strawberries that will be on the menu year-round. How would you meet this challenge? How would, how, I'm sorry, who would be in on the decision-making? How would you manage the cost fluctuations throughout the year? How would you make sure uh, you have guests buy in what buy in when lots of consumers know that strawberries are seasonal. And uh, the table, the group and I, we came up with first you want to talk to quality insurance because you have to get their approval first because you always want to protect the brand. And then you have to partner with the distributors and the growers because you want to ID the best sources because you want to keep your cost of, uh, more at level during the winter months when we all know that strawberries is not in season. And you have to put up a disclaimer, you know, uh, subject to availability on the menu that protects us just in case if something happens to where we may run out of strawberries for a couple of days or so. And then we, um, during the winter months, you can um, do a preparation. You know, for example, you want to macerate the strawberries. And this will... You know, you want to add flavor. Also, it, um, it utilizes less during those off months. 
just for, um, and also just like uh, a company that you know that may uh, advertise you know strawberry cheesecake. You know, it may be a loss leader as far as prices due to food costs, but it's a star on that menu. So you have to always have that on the menu. And then we can also go through communication and marketing, you know, as far as consuming the, uh, educating the consumer about, you know, having, you know, strawberry seasonal and then during the off months. Um, we have a social... We have a social media campaign. You know, you can advertise in store about as far as being strawberries, being in season, out of season. And you also want to promote season, um, promote se seasonality during uh, the peak. So it's like when, when strawberries is in season, you want to have big, bold, vibrant, you know, marketing strategies, maybe in the front of the menu. But during the off, uh, during the non-peak seasons, you may want to somewhere slide in that you do have, that, that you are offering strawberries, but it won't be as big. You know, somewhere in the middle or small on the back page or something like that. So. Great. Um, I've got a question for you, Gail. You, you talked about talking with um, QA as discrete from food safety also, or are they, are they one group? Uh, what's one group? It's Pardon? one group, okay. And then, um, one of the questions then was managing cost fluctuations. So how did you talk about that, managing um, those? Cost fluctuation came up to the point where as if we, if we partner with the distributors and the growers and then they should, um, if we went with someone and they had, you know, if they had progress, um, produce that, reports that go back two or three years and they know that during the off-peak months, strawberries may went up $20, 30 $40, which, which makes the, um, the brand can, um, cost out how much they can have that menu item so during the winter months it won't interfere with food costs or labor. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else have questions for Gail or John? Well, thank you, Gail. John? Okay. Uh, could we have team two up next, please? Sure. Hello, my name is Mary Kate Bell and I'm from Johnson and Wales University. Hello everyone, my name is Joyce and I'm from Le Cordon Bleu in Chicago. Uh, and so today um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, our challenge. So the question is, you are an on-site feeder and charged with adding a few vegan items to the menu. Um, so basically, um, we talked about introducing the idea first uh, to everyone and explain to them what exactly is uh, veganism and what products you can use and, you know, doing um, uh, research about it and talking to dietitians and nutritionists and getting some of them maybe um, on the site and explaining uh, to people um, what exactly it is, uh, how can you use it, uh, what can you use and what can't you use. Um, we talked about also um, some sampling uh, items. So I think a lot of people, uh, when they think about veganism, they kind of shy away from it because sometimes it does have this whole, um, oh, you know, what's that kind of a factor and um, it's a bit negative sometimes. And I think um, sampling uh, helps because they can really taste the flavor and they, you know, you, you, you don't just go up to them and say, oh, this is vegan. You go, no, this is X, Y, and Z pureed with, you know, A, B, and C um, so that they can really know uh, how it tastes like. And then, um, and then they know, oh, it's actually vegan. Okay, well, you know, it tastes pretty good. I think ultimately at the end of the day we need to be able to provide the research too for the people that are eating the vegan food and not advertising it as vegan itself. Uh, I think anything with a friendly appeal as in the image and everything, um, avoiding the negativity and the taste and the flavor and providing the certain examples uh, with the sampling as well. Um, and we can talk about the health benefits and how that is a good thing to have and especially in your diet, daily diet. Uh, so marketing um, and using social media uh, packaging advocates to really kind of um, get uh, people on board um, to really understanding what veganism is is a, is a really good way. So social media, everyone's in on social media. We've all got phones, all, you know, we're all connected and, you know, well in. Um, and so that, uh, that plays a huge factor in the marketing aspect. Um, 
with uh, sustainability versus health. Uh, so I think um, sometimes uh, when you read about veganism, it does have some negative images where people are like, oh, you know, they're not really getting um, the protein that they need, you know, um, iron and all of that. And I think people uh, shy away from that. But then when you also think about um, the say, the sustainability factors that uh, veganism has, you know, you're not, you know, you're not using animal products. I think when people really think about that and think about that concept behind veganism, then they can, you know, really kind of start to get on board and then do a bit of research themselves and then, you know, um, really uh, kind of be a bit, have a bit of a positive attitude more towards veganism. Um, and I think um, we also talked about having the friendly appeal, uh, so less so the whole, oh, this is meat-free, but, you know, this is um, what it is and how it tastes and that kind of thing. Uh, just like before we talked about the protein supplements and our discussion table specifically talked about that and how uh, mainly main dishes will have 11 to 15 percent of a protein supplement. So it's uh, adding more of that but also more of the vegetables and the fruits and all that to your daily diet as well. Great. Any and, questions? And then did you talk about your distributor also? Yes, uh, we said that we could get the distributor in on, on the site to talk to people about it, um, explain uh, you know, what you can use, what you can't use, um, and how to use it. Got it. Thank you. What is, what is, what is a protein supplement? Uh, tofu based, uh, for example. Um, yeah, right, you can use um, soybeans, um, uh, quinoa. The key is not Mm -hmm. Meaning the supplement has a bad connotation to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you, Chef, for that comment. Did you have a question or you're adjusting your glasses? Okay. Um, Mary Kate, Joyce, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and team number three, please. Um, my name is Jerry. I'm from Little Carlin Blue. This is my partner. I'm Chris Anchins. I'm from Johnson and Wales. And uh, our challenge was: we are a school food service operator in a district that is challenged financially, and we are asked to comply with new ruling that requires fresh produce to be increased by 22 percent. Um, so we said the first thing we have to do is we needed to find out where we are, like physically, with how much we are actually implementing in our school district. Um, how much is that costing us because we're, you know, constrained on our budget. Um, so who's making the calls on what we can do, how much money we have to spend, and, you know, where we get our produce from. Um, after that, we said, you know, we need to figure out how much each of the meals costs and what portion of that has to be the produce. And if we're going to increase produce by 22%, how can we do that without going over what each meal has to cost? Um, from there, we also thought about, is there other ways in the food service that we are using that is costing us money where we can reduce that to put that more towards buying the food so that we can increase it a little easier and still have room in that budget? Um, so that took care of the first question of, of um, what would be the first thing you'd want to do to tackle this challenge? Um, so then it says, where do you want to go from there on how to do that? So we decided to go to increase by 22%. We wanted to first work our way back down the distribution channel, talk with our suppliers, see if there's a way we can lock in a price for uh, our produce so that way it doesn't fluctuate throughout the year and we don't end up having to pay more because it, the price suddenly skyrocketed. But if we get this in the beginning of the year, hey, we want corn at this price, it's not going to change on us. Um, we also wanted to go find programs that, you know, if they have a product that, you know, so one supplier only wants the perfect item. You know, if there's something that we could use that isn't necessarily that perfect item, but it's still going to be, you know, healthy and flavorful and nutritious to the students that we can use to implement, why not do that and possibly get it for a discounted rate that will also increase our produce but not kill our budget. And then also I was thinking about because the school is all about ed education, so we saw the school should have talked about the local farm, we have a relationship with the local farm, with, even with the uh, inventory inventory dealers so they can offer discounts for the school and for the children and another important thing is for us and we should involve the school into the food maybe have relationship with local farm like offering 
the students go to the local farm, start to planting their own planet or, or like growing their own fruit, and then having the school offering courses such as like cooking classes and also like uh, um, health classes. They're talking about how uh, eating healthy is good for you and how you make the food in like same food in cafeteria. So when the food goes to the cafeteria, they will be more involved into the like, oh, this is maybe it's the food I, I grow in the farm last week, or maybe this is something I learned in the classes. So they, they will be more interested in eating, taking into the food in like unconsciously by like even when you're increasing the increasing the fresh products and this is most of our strategy any questions so let me let me ask you a question so um, your question was around in increasing um, the servings by 22% it didn't it didn't say we're going to measure consumption so um, some of the school studies would indicate that even though we're making more servings of fruits and vegetables to children in schools today, what we're doing is increasing our waste at the same time. Did you address at all how you make that flavorful or make that appealing to, to the... Yes, because the usually for fresh vegetables, there's a lot of yield. And we can think about using those yields, making, for, uh, for example, put, put those like extra yield into your stock or putting into your sauces. And so even the students do not realize they're, they don't visually see the vegetables in the, in the products, but when they eat it, they will have the taste, they will have the, they will take in the nutrients, they will, they will, they will, they will have the things in there. So yeah, it will save your cost. Great. Let me get one question over here. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, was there any discussion regarding uh, like the imperfect produce, uh, what we would call number twos or you know, set like a second harvest type. Yes, there was. We were so we were talking. Uh, okay. Um, so we were we were talking about how you know if for example if you're making a sauce or something where you just need a say you need a pepper and you just you're gonna end up chopping it up or you know pureeing it. It doesn't need to be that nice long perfect pepper, but the ones that people don't necessarily want because you know they don't look appealing. But if it's just gonna get chopped up anyways, it's gonna cost less for you to use. But at the same time, you know it's not gonna it's still gonna have the flavor and it's gonna be just as good. So we didn't bring that up, and you know we talked about cross-utilizing a lot of our uh, product across the board too, in different aspects of it. Great. Any other questions? Create creativity out of your group. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. You can introduce your team, Chad. Hi, my name's Chad, and I'm the team. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, my name's Chad. I'm at Le Cordon Bleu. Um, I did my undergraduate at University of Illinois where I studied hospitality, uh, managed at Wildfire of Lettuce Entertain You for a couple of years, and uh, decided to take a step back to further my education on the foods on the back outside of the restaurant business. Um, at any rate, so our group was discussing how to spice up a salad bar. Um, more specifically, the question was, we've had a myriad of complaints on our salad bar and a set of follow-up questions. Uh, more specifically, how are we going to get more feedback um, what are we going to do to cost effectively upgrade? Uh, number three is who are we going to involve in this decision making process and what would prompt a change in uh, suppliers? And lastly, after the change, what are we going to do with unhappy customers? Um, so to start with, with feedback, of course, obviously it's all about the consumer. Um, first and foremost, we want to understand the audience and their preferences. Um, you can look at what is selling the old 80-20 rule, 80% um, of your business coming from 20% of the items. So knowing that, but digging deeper, um, you can obviously partner with research groups and do customer insights, find out what they're liking, why they're liking it, what they're disliking, and then you cross-reference that with costs and uh, what's going to be most effective to keep or get rid of. Um, and then another great way to get feedback is with employees. So you can go directly to employees and employee surveys, but also what's very important is your first line of management who are working directly with those employees and picking their brains and figuring out what's working and what's not. Um, to, oh, for upgrading the uh, offerings without breaking the bank, we kind of, as a group, we broke it down into three sections. Uh, if I could do this real quick. So we looked at um, the greens, the toppings, and then the dressings and the crispy crunchies, as we called it, which are your garnishes for texture. Um, with greens, you want to find a way to be creative to make it look lively. Um, it, when it comes to freshness, it's about tightening up your supply chain, making sure turnover is effective, managers are doing a good job changing things up, um, and then you know, a great, another great example with freshness in salad bars is the red oak leaf. Um, you know, that has that short shelf life. One bad 
uh, red oak leaf can damage the perception of the entire tray. Um, so getting customized blends from your suppliers, talking to those suppliers, figuring out what's the best way to get them involved to make sure you're utilizing freshness um, and the prices that go along with it. Um, same goes for toppings. You got to think creatively, you know, as a um, culinary student, get chefy with it. You know, with toppings on salad bars, you have your classic toppings like carrots, red onions, tomatoes, cucumbers, and then you want to find a way to be trendy. Vinegared items are very, or pickled items, I should say, are very in right now. Um, so how are you going to utilize those different aspects to keep your salad bar fresh? Which is ironic, because salad bars are not fresh in general anymore. But uh, I digress. So who do you involve? You want to involve everybody in the supply chain, um, all the way up from the farmer to the distributor, the supplier, picking, you know, getting information from all aspects. If something's going wrong with freshness, where is it taking place and what can you do to fix that? Um, and then you make a change if contacting your suppliers, they're not getting the job done, you change. <coughs> Lastly, um, is how to bring back unhappy customers. Again, it's all about education. Um, sampling is a really good thing to do, but the best marketing thing is telling your story. What are you doing and why are you doing it? We decided to freshen up our salad bar because we're focusing on organic and because it's healthier and we want you to eat the salad bar because we're going to have a shift in the produce market and make that a bigger portion percentage of your plate. Um, these are the things that people want to hear and that will change their behavior. Um, and then, you know, you continue to push that with your frontline employees, having your front of house employees, your servers, whoever they are, giving samples, upselling, telling the customers what's going on. And um, with all that, we'll fix our myriad of complaints on the sidebar. Great. How did he do, folks? <laughs> um, one, one question for you, Chad. I heard you say that you would talk about organic because it's healthier. Hmm. Oh. Sorry, that was off the okay. cuff. It I need to back that up with some actual facts, which I don't have. And I can be misguided about in general. Good answer, good answer. Yes. Uh, <laughs> if you've not seen a study, too, um, Rafi Taharian from Yale Dining will be here later this afternoon on one of her panels. Did a great uh, concept around reorganization of a salad bar that increased consumption. It's a great study. So if you're interested in salad bars, catch Rafi later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Appreciate Chad. It. Appreciate it. So uh, my name is Alex Russell. I'm a senior at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Farron. I'm also a senior at Johnson & Wales in Rhode Island. Um, today we were asked, uh, today we were put in the situation that we are a university. Um, our students are complaining that they are gaining more than the freshman 15. And the question was, how can you use fresh produce to offer more flavorful dishes with less calories? Um, other questions that actually were involved in that is where do you go for ideas? How do you involve the student body? How do you keep costs down? And how do you change the menu items on a regular basis to keep students engaged? So first of all, we started with the problem is obviously students are complaining that they're getting too much weight. Obviously they're getting too much weight because of high carbs and empty calories and whether it's they're uneducated or the school is uneducated on healthier options and alternatives. Now we came up with some solutions, um, surveying students and asking them their eating habits, um, if there are any, in, any um, new items that they're willing to try, or you know, their favorites, something that they, you know, a family um, recipe, maybe something that they eat on the holidays that they'd like to see. Um, what are their off-campus favorites? Where do they go to eat off more often so that we can see how much money they're spending? What are their expectations? Um, and what do you think could make you eat healthier? So getting their opinion on you know, what, what would inspire them and um, influence them to change their eating habits, because obviously they want to since they're complaining, so they're already on board. We just need to get them fully on board and let them know their voice is being heard and we're going to start making some changes. Um, another solution, uh, actually expounding on the last one, educating students, um, we did provide culinary exhibitions and demonstrations in the school quad uh, while handing out samples and it might be the a, a produce item that they either have had before but wasn't prepared right or something that they've actually never had before and opening them to new 
like expanding their palate and opening them to new ideas in, while they're eating. Uh, highlighting cuisines is a big thing because many other cuisines revolve around um, produce, are more veg-centric. And um, so pro providing cuisines that they're not used to um, could uh, expand their palate as well. Um, culture, cu cultural significance is another thing. Um, like, I think the, the, the Yale director of uh, the, the cafeteria over there, he does a theme salad, so he won't put out a bunch of different things that will just go with, don't go with each other, they'll put out themed stuff, so like a Greek salad, all the components, kalamata olives, everything, and feta, and that they'll, they'll actually enjoy the salad, not just a smorgasbord of their favorite toppings on top of their salad. And then expanding on that, they, um, our group came up with an excellent idea to tell a story. Tell a story about a certain, whether it's a side dish or the main dish, highlight this produce and tell a story. Why is a Greek salad a Greek salad? Just a little, get the students engaged. Let them know that this isn't just a salad, it's more than that. And eating healthy is important. Um, posting on the school website is another good way. Um, to broadcast that the school is now offering healthier options. And um, offerings, a dining room layout is something that I've noticed as a student is a big problem. When you walk into an all-you-can-eat dining room facility, you see up front the fries, burgers, onion rings, all that stuff is right up front, and then salad bars tucked all the way in the back, the fresh fruit is over there. So all these kids fill up on this, this garbage, and then the, the salads like the salads an afterthought so it's it's almost like highlight the fresh stuff um have them fill up on that and then maybe onion rings if you're good <laughs> <laughs> um upselling and highlighting produce is another thing um not just the item of not just the produce item but the me method of preparation a lot of people I know that I tell, well now it's getting bigger, but back in the day when Brussels sprouts were just getting more and more popular, people would say, oh, Brussels sprouts, um, yeah, I, my mom's made those before. They're just like those steamy, gooey lumps. And that's because they probably had them boiled, overboiled, or oversteamed. So we, highlighting the method of prep and also accompaniments is very, very important to getting people to eat healthier. Um, a late night salad bar, would be also a great idea as well because students, as you know, are always up late and eat garbage late at night. Um, so maybe a discount salad bar or even a rewards program that if you buy a certain amount of salads, get one free, any, something like that. Um, incorporating healthier vending machines and offering um, vegetables and fruit, just bowls of uh, fruit. Um, and always keeping the menu, always changing the menu, um, keeping students interested in the food that they're being offered. So, you know, one week or one week would be, you know, a highlight on Mediterranean food and Greek salad. Next week, Italian food. Next week, Indian food. You know, um, expand their horizons and teach them things that they don't know and let them know one of the most, going back on posting um, and letting, letting students know that their voice is being heard, I think is most important because you're truly engaging them. If they brought up, they brought up this issue in the first place, so it's now it's up to the university to address the problems and to keep these students happy because they're paying, you know, they're paying good money to uh, attend the school. And I think, especially when you're at this age, this is when you start really developing certain eating habits. So if you grew up, you know, with, with your family eating, all frozen processed food, you're probably going to con continue that. But if you go to, you know, you go to, uh, to college and you see, oh, they've got this salad bar and you're learning all this stuff and trying things you've never tried before. And like you said, Brussels sprouts, you go home and you say, you, we have Brussels sprouts on the menu. And this, that was delicious. So we, we teach them how to, how to go home and cook those Brussels sprouts for themselves. And then maybe they can tell their friends. And it just goes on from there. And then when they end up having a family, then they, they um, that the eating habits are developed throughout. So this, it's not just a, a um, train of just eating this processed, horrible food. Oh, and, um, oh, we're not done. We're not done. <laughs> we're not done yet. So we forgot to put cost on here. Um, in regards to cost, uh, we talk with all different types of distributors. So instead of just keeping our main distributors, um, 
I mean, I don't know exactly how that works yet, but I remember my boss told me, um, I think there was like oranges or something he, he bought from a different distributor and they were this certain amount cheaper. And that saves that saved him money just by switching one, buying one piece of produce from a different distributor. So really, you know, talking to all different distributors and purveyors, um, working with purveyors uh, that would like to sponsor or promote healthy eating habits for college students, um, you know, um, letting them know that this is what we're trying to accomplish and being consistent and just, you know, ordering smart, like just ordering correctly, make sure you're, um, you're not ordering too much or too, too little so you have just enough. What I've found about campus dining in my experiences is that you always have the same options day to day, week to week. If you keep uh, students on their toes and keep a changing menu and keep them interested in the food that they're eating at school, not just like, oh, let's go to the cafeteria and get the same thing I've gotten for the past couple of years here. Um, and also providing, provide the wide variety of choices for them to, to for, and have them to make the choice, provide everything for them. And um, in conclusion, it must be a collaborative effort overall. Um, if, if the school is not doing enough to provide variety, in the, it, it go, goes hand in hand with the student also having to make the right decision as well. Great, thank you. <laughs> any, any questions for Alex or Veronica? I was, I was impressed, I'll say, I was really impressed by your focus on your end consumer. We heard that in a workshop yesterday, how we just have to be as an industry laser focused on the consumer experience. And I just heard you say that over and over, so thank you. Well, first we would have to contact whoever's in charge of our campus dining and maybe either collect a petition or some type of thing saying that we would, <laughs> we would like a change. I don't know. I mean, yeah, a lot of the students are used to eating the same thing. They have their favorites, so. Um, I currently live off campus, but I have a meal plan because I go to Starbucks, so. <laughs> So, also engaging though the off student um, or the off campus students that you know have had the meal plans because I think when you're a freshman you have to live on campus so you have to endure those delicious meal plans. Um, but you know, getting the uh, getting all of the students involved and um, making sure that you know the school making sure our voice is being heard. So if we get enough kind of like this, if we as a student body you know complain enough, maybe they'll start making some changes. The biggest change they've made is there's a Froyo um, place opening, so mm, that's about it. So, <laughs> yes. Definitely, definitely. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to give you my suggestion or Rafi's suggestion because I'm actually subbing for him today now. So you, you really kind of caused a problem by mentioning him so glowingly. But uh, um, um, somebody please tell Rafi I'm subbing for him. I love that. Um, my suggestion is that you don't go to the food service uh, personnel. You go to the contract administrator. Uh, and, and ask for, is there a student committee, an advisory committee, mm -hmm. and start that way, because I do agree that you shouldn't be confrontational right away, but Definitely. to develop a relationship between the students and the contract administrator and the food Definitely. service, because the campus would be more concerned than the, because the, 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 you have a contractor on campus. Yeah. It is so far. Oh. Oh, well that, oh, well that changes the whole thing. Now I'm really curious why you're not better. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's the issue here. Yeah, but I would still go to the person in charge of the food program, and then I would go to the, the, that person's supervisor Definitely. or something, because I think student life professionals are much more concerned yes. about your satisfaction. And, uh, and you can relate it back to what I talked about, which is that we're not getting our education outside the classroom because we don't gather and socialize enough. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.